there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Britain is a hotel nation. The hospitality industry is worth a staggering £114 billion a year to the UK economy, and we have over half a million hotel rooms. But there's a problem. Far too many British hotels aren't up to scratch. Eminent hotelier Ruth Watson has been in the business for over 25 years. For too long, British hotels have offered poor standards, but now with so many holidaymakers staying at home, it's time to raise the bar. Britain deserves better. Ruth wants to nip the problem in the bud by helping six new hoteliers get it right before the rot sets in. If I can offer advice to first-time hoteliers right from the outset, then I think I can stop them making catastrophic mistakes. What the hell do you know about running a hotel? Absolutely well, nothing. <laughs> I think it's not rocket science, but I, I might be wrong. She'll take them from initial concept to building and design work. You bored her the whole time on being completely impractical and just, if I totally read up your own asses about it. And send them behind the scenes at Britain's top hotels. This time, it's Diana and Steve of Suffolk. I'll be absolutely frank, it looks like a tip. The cupboard is stuck and I'll add to the clutter. I feel I'm in a defensive position here. Well, you are being defensive. Yep. But when Ruth sends in her undercover inspector, will the hoteliers get top marks or fail to make the grade? The inspector has given me your rating. Suffolk has 25 million visitors a year. With 600 hotels and 1,800 B&Bs, it has a tourist economy worth £1.6 billion annually. Greeting St Mary is a small village in the countryside seven miles north of the town of Ipswich. Creating House has been home for 15 years to Diana Graham and Steve Fernie and their three children, Jessica, Kia and Alex. This has been a family home for a long time and it's been great fun. We brought the children here when they were five, six and eight and they have now left home. Like many parents in their mid-fifties, Steve and Diana are left alone with an empty nest, crammed full of family memories and belongings. I can't justify uh, two old people rattling around a big old house. It's just mad to me. And the solution to that is to convert it into a guest house. This is a major life change for Diana, who spent decades in the music industry rising to managing director of Arista Records. Steve has also had a successful music career and now works from home running 60s icon Manfred Mann's label. Despite supporting the B&B venture, he plans to take a back seat. This is Diana's gig. She will run it the way she wants and I'm more than happy to take a secondary role. Diana wants a new career and for this large house to pay for its own upkeep in the future. So she and Steve have borrowed £100,000 to convert this former rectory into a B&B. &B. But with no experience and their home packed to the rafters with a generation of possessions, they have a massive challenge ahead. It's December. And to help Diana and Steve turn their home into a hotel, they've called in Ruth Watson. I've been to a number of auctions in my life and I feel as if I've just walked into an auctioneer's room. What's going on here? <laughs> well, part of it is clearing stuff out uh, in order to do the guest house because you know, this is our family home. What makes you think you can run a guest house? I think probably I've been running a guest house for years, you know, when you have three teenagers and all their friends. Do they pay you? Uh, no, of course well, then not. then you haven't been running a guest house. Well, you, you know what I'm saying. Currently, the first floor has six bedrooms and two bathrooms, which will become five bedrooms, all with ensuite facilities. Downstairs, they plan to use the middle reception, currently Steve's office, as the guest breakfast room, and the corner reception will be used as a function room for future events. Aha! 
Aha. Another <laughs> depository for <laughs> stuff. Yes, but look at it. It's a big picture. You have an awful lot of junk. My major concern is that I've now been into two areas and both of them are full of stuff. And the house is the same everywhere, I'm afraid. Some things we can keep. For instance, the chairs. That's a shame. I'd hoped they were going. They're just hideous, aren't they? Hmm. They were cheap. They're very comfortable. They're hideous. I think they live in chaos. And I don't think they think the way a guest house owner should. And they certainly don't live their lives the way a guest house owner needs to if they're going to get return visits from people. But this is only a fraction of what Steve and Diana have hoarded over the years. Outside, a huge barn is stockpiled with the family's bric-a-brac. Welcome to my office. <laughs> While Steve's office is a treasure trove of memorabilia from 35 years in the record industry. What was this going to be used for? I thought as a dining room for the guests' breakfast. OK. How about we rethink and the end room beautifully light. No. It would make a very nice breakfast room up there. Yes. When planning the layout of a new B&B, don't just think about space, think about light. There are an enormous amount of things that you have to consider when you start to go public, as it were. Do you know what you have to achieve in terms of stars? Do I you? want to go four stars, if we can, from right. day one. From day one, yes. right. I think you do really have to consider how much this is going to change your lifestyle, because it will. It's rare for novice hoteliers to achieve a four-star rating from the outset, and the required level of service will be very time-consuming. With five guest rooms, Diana could be looking at a daily round of ten breakfasts to prep, cook and clear, up to 60 sheets and towels to launder, four hours of cleaning, and an hour of admin. What I now want you to really focus on is the hardcore functionality of this. Let's talk about laundry. Yes. Who's doing it? Uh, I'll do it in here initially, I think. I have seen B&Bs where people spend their entire day just doing the laundry. No, no, I'm not going to do that. I've got better things to do. Well, this is the problem, you see. Even if you have one room, it's going to take you 45 minutes to clean. Multiply that by five. You mm -hmm. can see where we're going. Yes. You've already created the breakfast mess. Somebody's got to put that in the dishwasher, clean the pans, the things that won't go in the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. Yeah? You've got to tidy up where they've been. Steve, are you going to help? <laughs> Smiling won't just answer all the problems. One needs must. So you'll loaf around the place, n not helping in any way, shape or form, unless you think somebody's actually having a very hard time. I'm naturally lazy, but this is something we're doing together. And it's sort of, you know, you don't go to a marriage thinking there's only going to be one of you. Uh, don't look at me like that. I was going to say, it's a degree of scepticism written large on that pretty little face. It's been fairly obvious that Steve is just along for the ride. I don't think it's going to work because actually she's going to need some real support here. And unless he determines what his role is going to be and unless she says to him what she wants from him, I think this could end up with her doing all the work and with him just lolling around. This couple has a mammoth task ahead, but Steve isn't going down without a fight. I think you'll find we'll have enough opportunity to practice. <laughs> Hygiene rooms and making beds. And Ruth reads them the riot act. I'll be absolutely frank, it still looks like a tip. Hotelier Ruth Watson is helping Diana Graham and Steve Fernie convert their Suffolk home into a five bed B&B with ambitious four star aspirations. Bathmats. Diana is keen to get her hands dirty, but Steve, still in the music business, doesn't plan to get too involved with the nitty-gritty. I find the easiest way to do everything. I'm not the most lover of hard work, and therefore I find a way to avoid it if I can. Good housekeeping standards are vital in any hotel or B&B. Steve and Diana think that by picking up after their teenage kids, that this equates with the same standards of housekeeping that a paying guest would demand. This is so far from the truth that I'm sending them on an intensive housekeeping boot camp. 
Kensington's Baglioni Hotel is a five-star luxury experience which takes housekeeping to a whole new level under the charge of manager Rodrigo Camacho. His meticulous attention to detail has earned him a worldwide reputation. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Rodrigo Andrews, the Vision Manager. Welcome to Valioni. Rodrigo has agreed to share some of his trade secrets with Diana and Steve. So if you're ready, you just come with me and we're going to go upstairs. My favourite thing, cleaning. Under Rodrigo's watchful eye, each of the Baglioni's 126 rooms is cleaned for an hour a day, undergoing three levels of rigorous checks. Once the bed is made, next comes the bathroom, where the mirrors must be polished for 15 minutes to eradicate streaks. Wooden surfaces must be dusted three times, and cushions dropped on their corners for maximum plumpness. It would not have occurred to me to make the bed first because you're going to make the room dusty. And in a domestic situation, and you don't think too much about it, but uh, I certainly am thinking a lot about it now. Having shown them the regime, Rodrigo's got a test for Diana and Steve. Creeting House will have five guest rooms, so he wants them to clean five of his hotel rooms. A team of two housekeepers gets half an hour per room, so they'll get the same. So I prepared this little list. It's a room checklist. Ready for it? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah? You looking forward to it? No. Oh, yeah. Good luck. Ruth wants Steve to see that when Creeting House opens for business, he will have to help Diana on a daily basis. What we're going to have to do is practice how long it takes us to do each of our rooms. Out of his comfort zone, Steve is taking his frustration out on a duster. I think you'll find that we actually, in the real world, will have enough opportunity to practice tidying rooms and making beds. One, two, three, go. Whether making beds in a luxury London hotel or a country b, &B Rodrigo knows that professional standards should always be used. I thought when he gave me the checklist, I thought, oh, this is almost insulting. But no, it's not. It's right. You do need a checklist. Have you remembered to do the windowsill or whatever it is? After two and a half hours of hard physical labour, Steve and Diana are on their final bed. And Steve's on his last legs. I don't imagine it would be that complicated uh, or that intense. You know, I'm not a person that recently has been used to hard physical work. Diana and Steve are finally realising how much work is involved in housekeeping, especially if they want Creeting House to be four-star rated. I would rather pay somebody else to do the cleaning, but to do that, we need people staying there. Until the money's there, we've got to do it ourselves. Back in Suffolk, Diana has taken Ruth's advice about the breakfast room and is relocating it to the sunny corner room, rather than Steve's office. But Steve still has his marching orders. There's no way we can run a guest house with Steve running his office from there. It just won't work. When Steve's on the telephone telling jokes to his friends, you can hear it around the entire house. Uh, the thought of him being there next to the, the guests relaxing by the television. No. No, that, that one we can't do. It won't take you long when you get going, honest. Do you want a hand? No. No. I just want to be left on my own. So look at all the memories that we've got. Underneath your desk, there's a great amount of stuff that I just shoved there, and Ruth was coming to visit. Well, you weren't trying to hide my Charles and Di kneeling still, were you? Steve may have to relinquish his office, but there is a big love in Diana's life that she needs to give up. Biggest problem is that I'm not going to be able to smoke in my own house anymore, which means I'm going to have to give up, which means... I'm not quite sure what to do. <laughs> Steve jokingly says to me, you know, well, perhaps we can build you a hut in the garden and you can go and smoke out there. But of course I can't, because I'm going to have to be here for all the guests. Many people think that to open a B&B, &B, all you need is a spare room or two. But there is a lot of red tape. Diana and Steve have a budget of £100,000 for their conversion, and only a fraction of that covers the decor. First, you may need planning permission to convert your home to a business. Secondly, your rooms must meet the legal fire safety standards. This means installing fire doors, smoke alarms, fire extinguishers and security lighting. 
At Creeting House, this is costing £30,000, working out at £6,000 per rentable room. Diana wants four stars, but will have to make costly changes before she can apply for a rating. What she doesn't know is that Ruth has booked a secret inspector to grade the B&B when it opens in June, just six months away. As the building work at Creeting House gathers pace, the budget is disappearing fast. Ruth wants Diana to think ahead to bedroom design and layout. I think it's fair to say that a guest house or B&B can be much more quirky, much more characterful, much more personal, but nevertheless, it still has to function. Now, if I was designing this particular room, this is the obvious place for me to put down my suitcases, my luggage rack, and if you were doing built-in stuff, this is where I would have that kind of thing. You really do have to think ahead, preempt every single thing that somebody does in a bedroom. Always remember that thing about lying in bed and thinking, oh, sorry, the light's still on in the other corner of the room. How is that going to be dealt with? Diana plans to make this room the master bedroom. Once the room is cleared, she and Steve intend to replace the twin beds with the mahogany four-poster from their own room. Mismatched furniture will be exchanged for usable antique pieces and there'll be a chaise longue to provide elegant seating in the corner. For Music Man Steve, one element of room design is of particular interest. One thing I've always wanted to see in a hotel room, and that's a hi-fi. Why don't hotels have hi-fi? Because I'm sleeping in the room next door to you and I don't want to hear your bloody music. As floorboards are ripped out to bring the electrics up to guest house standards, Diana gets stuck into the decorating. But Steve's still playing a supporting role. Some people think Steve's lazy, but um, he doesn't. And, uh, but he doesn't like doing physical work, and he doesn't like to do it yourself. Um, I'm, I'm a goer, I'm a doer. I, I have a go at anything and try my best. I'm perhaps not the perfectionist that uh, is needed to run a hotel, but uh, uh, I certainly go for it. <laughs> Part of Diana's plan to clear out the house includes evicting Steve and his musical memorabilia. So this is my rabbit hutch that I have given up creating house for so I can in inhabit this space. The strange thing about Diana is she thinks ten paces ahead. She also realises that it would make a really good suite of rooms for disabled people. So I'm not sure how long I'm going to be allowed to be here before I have to give up the room. It's March. With Diana hoping to open in June, Ruth has returned to Creating House to see how the building and clearance works are coming along. It's three months since I was here and I can see one very obvious change. A lot of stuff has gone. Yeah. Some of it's stored right. and some of it we've sold. Why but, doesn't uh... that surprise me? <laughs> the gold discs and LPs have gone, but now Steve's old office holds a record lot of junk. <laughs> It's the logical place just to dump for the moment. The VHS tapes and all the stuff, that'll go to the skip. The beds may or may not be used. Are you really intending to keep the plastic leathered chairs? Are they going to be a long stair? They will be used for functions. I don't want to be negative about this, but there has to be a time when you actually say that's going in the bin. We have cleared an enormous amount, Ruth, and uh, yes, there's a way to go yet, but... Uh... We're getting there. Upstairs, it's now clear that rather than throwing stuff away, Diana has just been moving it from room to room. Ah, now this was the room I spent a long time talking about where things went, isn't yes. it? And I'll be absolutely frank, it still looks like a tip, most of it. Ruth, of course, has come up again with the question of so much clutter in our house. But uh, frankly, it's all been so hectic with the builders, we haven't thrown away as much as we should have done so far, but we'll all be gone, um, other than our own private rooms, and if we wish to clutter those up, we will. <laughs> we will put the rooms together, and then we will throw things out at that point. But I am going to take issue with you, Steve, because I know you are not going to use that old television. You're absolutely that right. But our children used to watch that TV. Well, 
fine. Give it to your children <laughs> as a memento. I'm not advocating that you turn this into some incredibly modern place that has no character. I just feel that you would have greater clarity about it all and just physical space to move around and start trying things out. With just three months to lay open, Ruth is concerned about the effect of Steve and Diana's hoarding habit on their design ethos. They're not the kind of people where it should be really clean, sharp lines and everything very modern. It wouldn't sit well with the house, it wouldn't sit well with them. But nevertheless, you do have to have some overall design idea about how it's going to look. It can't be quite as random as it currently is. Ruth is sending them to Miller's residence, a West London guest house. The owners combine their distinct taste with functionality, something she hopes Diana and Steve will learn from. <laughs> Gosh, this is amazing, isn't it? This is Clutterville. Every corner there's something, so you can kind of look around everywhere. Run by Cara Miller, daughter of an antiques collector, it's been carefully arranged like a museum of curiosities without feeling haphazard. When I first walked through the front door, I was just knocked out. It was just, it's crazy. There's so many bits and pieces, and yet somehow it didn't look staged. It just looked like it had grown there. And then you realise just how wacky it is. Just as Diana and Steve hoped to, Miller's provides a homely and welcoming guest experience. So this is our seating area. Um, it's where the guests have drinks in the evening or relax in the day. The thing I really like, the audacity of keeping a broken chair and building something around it, it's just fantastic. If it's part of your entire design, yes. then yes. If most of your other things are quite neutral, that kind of shocks people because they don't know what they're getting, so it either has to be one or the other. It's eight bedrooms, rent for up to £230 a night. So this is our salon room, the Wordsworth. Really homely and very comfortable. Downstairs evolved, but upstairs, you know, there is a definite bedroom design. If people want space, they need space to walk around. Yeah. Yeah. And then you add to it? No, or generally did you we choose? don't add to these. It's essential that if Creeting House is to retain its owner's charms, it mustn't look a mess. Three places they could learn from include Zanzibar in Hastings, where the rooms are inspired by and furnished from owner Max's travels. Lena Proudlock's Barclay House in the Cotswolds, which showcases her photography and design work. And South London's Church Street Hotel, where two brothers' homage to their Spanish roots complements their design ethos. At Miller's, Steve is inspired. I'll take away the freedom to be able to do what we want with our house. We have to be ourselves. You can't do a place like this. We couldn't do a place identical to this because it wouldn't be us. But there is a place that is us, and we can do what we want. And that's what's important. Having grown up in hotels, Cara is a veteran <laughs> of dealing with paying guests in her own home. Got to get a, a house in order. Uh, and it, it's weird, because suddenly you've got a home, and then you haven't. I have no inbuilt desire to run a guest house. You have to like people being in your home. You have to be comfortable welcom welcoming strangers and making them feel at home and making them feel instantly at home. How do you deal with people you don't like? Just smile and nod. <laughs> but uh, afterwards, do you, do you take bookings or are you generally full for those people afterwards? No, we take bookings. Again and again? We're a business. I cannot, in all honesty, say I will not resent a guy that comes into our house that I really think is abusing it and is just not very nice. But you still have to be polite and make sure they have a good time and make sure when they leave they don't know that you really didn't like them. I think it's quite funny that Steve doesn't like people in his house. Um, he's going to have to get used to it. If he wants to have a B&B, &B, if he wants to run a B&B, &B, or he's going to have to hide <laughs> in a room somewhere. As opening day draws near, Ruth orchestrates a dress rehearsal. Ooh, nearly a disaster. The ballet is unchoreographed. And Steve still has commitment issues. Nothing's going to change me. I do not want to run a guest. Creeting House is Steve and Diana's family home.
But now their kids have flown the nest, they're converting the empty rooms into a five-bedroom B&B. It's March, and with just three months until opening, Ruth Watson is worried Steve's still not committed to the project. Steve and Diana have skills to learn, and I think while Diana is very aware of the shortcomings, I'm not sure that Steve is. I'd like to see him personally care more about doing this B&B in a professional manner. Ruth wants to prove to Steve that running a guest house isn't a one-woman job. Even an everyday duty like serving breakfast demands a team effort. What I want you to do is basically cook breakfast for eight or ten people. Steve, I'm also going to ask you to do something. If I was to imagine my job, my job is covering up the cracks. It's basically, I'll be in there making a couple of jokes to people who want to talk, and I'm the MC of breakfast, I think. <laughs> Ruth has rounded up some builders and neighbours as breakfast guinea pigs. Diana will cook, but first, Steve must take the orders. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. First of all, all of our breakfast food is freshly cooked, so it'll take a little bit of time. So if you could be patient, that would be wonderful. You can't say that, Steve. <laughs> well, I'm not serving a, I'm not serving no, 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 seriously, you can't ask them to be patient because they've come down for breakfast. Dan, you have to have the sausages at least part cooked because, okay. you know, you're looking at 20, 25 minutes. It is too long to wait if people don't want cereal or something first. With most B&Bs offering breakfast within a two-hour window and guests appearing at any time, there is a real skill to serving it promptly. To minimise prep time, B&B owners pre-cook their sausages in the oven. Tomatoes and bacon can also be cooked in advance and kept warm until needed. Even poached eggs can be made ahead of time, plunged into cold water to stop them cooking further and kept in the fridge. When the guests come down, the eggs can be reheated, the sausage is browned in the pan, and everything's ready to go. Cooking aside, Steve is realising that even the apparently simple task of taking orders can be a minefield. Do you any vegetarian options at all? I'm afraid we don't. Uh, but you can have extras of everything, non-vegetarian if you like. But if I can have an extra sausage. Just the standard breakfast, but no baked beans. Have you got any tinned tomatoes? I'm afraid we don't. There are six guests at the table, but Steve's one order short. Now, how have I only got five? And at what point does someone step in and say, you've messed this up? It really is important to write out exactly what each person wants. Or if it's the full Monty's, I mean, we just call it FM at, um, at our place. <laughs> and then just put no baked beans, BB, will be enough. When they serve paying customers, Steve will have to relay his orders quickly and efficiently to Diana in the kitchen. The two two, full Monty, no mushrooms. Well, that doesn't sound right. One, two, no, six bacon. Communication is key. The chef must be kept in the loop at all times. Steve's busy making toast, so I don't know how many eggs I need to do. Eggs. Given that the toast has hit the table about 50 minutes or nearly an hour after people have sat down, you're going to have to improve the toast service, Steve. It's well worth waiting for, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah. It's cold. Ooh. Nearly a disaster. And double eggs. Eventually, right. after an hour's wait, that's breakfast very, is very served. Important. So, how did you like it, guys? Very nice. Filling, lovely. I can't add much more. It was fantastic. Can I just say, it does all look very nice. All people would be very happy to get it. Thank you very much. But we've obviously seen you struggling in a way that I wouldn't want you to struggle in the future. Because um, the ballet is unchoreographed at the moment. <laughs> I still don't think Steve is taking it seriously enough. This is going to be reality, and you are going to be sharing your house with people who are going to pay money, who will want a certain level of service. If you think that I'm not capable of learning how to do a job like that, that's sadly wrong. I can do it if I want to. That's the point. But do you really, really want to do it? I do not want to run a guest house. It is not number one on my priority, right? Now, if you're going to say, I need to change my personality, 
That ain't going to happen either. I'm not saying anything like this no. at all. I do think you mustn't stumble along thinking, I'll pick up as it goes on, because your customers are not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Well, the well, first one that walks in the door wants perfection. Everybody can tell me that the first one in the door will be the one that gets the best service, because it's something you learn. If we are no good at this, neither of us will want to do it. We both agree on that. I sound because I feel I'm in a defensive position here. Well, you are being defensive. Yeah, because of the stance I take with you all the time, well, in the same way that you take a stance. No, I understand I'm not everything you're saying. Stance. I'm actually trying to help you, and what I'm saying is, the day you open your door, there will be an expectation from your Absolutely. customers. Diana, do you have any doubts that we could not do this? None at all. Good. Ruth's words have finally struck home for Steve and Diana. There's a lot of work still to do, but Diana is taking the big step of driving her old life to the dump. I think the biggest problem clearing everything out is, is getting rid of our lives from a lot of the house. Steve is, is, has been quite upset about uh, the children's bedrooms being you know, completely taken over. But Steve has found a way to keep the history of his family home alive by personalising each guest room. The sentimental old chap that I am, I wanted to call them after the kids. Trying to maintain a, an identity. You know, at the end of the day, it was uh, our home for 15 years with the kids. And uh, it's a nod to them that they're still part of it as well. It's not just one way. No, it's all right. No more clutter! No more clutter! Despite their efforts, one room is messier than ever. Steve's old office is jammed full of homeless keepsakes. The cupboard is stuck. And behind it, we've got lots of things to clear. And I'll add to the clutter by putting that box in it. <laughs> Diana has managed to curb, if not beat, her hoarding habit. But there's another addiction she was planning to kick. My plans for smoking have uh, changed somewhat. I hoped to have given up by now, but the stress of getting open has been fairly horrid, and I've been smoking twice as much, and so the decision was, I'm just going to smoke outside in future. With so much time and money invested in the project, and opening day imminent, Diana is determined to get the details right. Cleaning for yourself is entirely different from cleaning for other people. And I just hope we're clean enough. I think we are. <laughs> I'm shattered. Do you know, anybody setting up a and b should have more sense. But if they only knew how much hard work it is. It's been such a slog. You've now got what you wanted at the beginning, which is a, a house with lots of rooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of toilets. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. And as of today, they all work, by the way, all of the toilets. <laughs> so you're sort of flushed with success? Oh, I am, I am. Six months have passed since Ruth's first visit, and Diana and Steve have finally acted on her advice about chaos control. The former spare room was a repository for old TVs. It's now been remodelled as the four-poster room, selling for £90 a night. The children's rooms used to be typical teenage dens. They've now been transformed into relaxing guest rooms at £80. Downstairs, the corner room was unused and unloved. But Diana has listened to Ruth and created a bright, sunny breakfast room for guests. The Creeting house is crowded no more. Now there's just paired back homeliness. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hi Steve. Hi. Hello, Diana. Nice to see you. I, I can't believe this hall. Look at it. <laughs> well, no wardrobes. <laughs> no wardrobes. And it looks like a hall. Gosh, you really have made progress here. Here we go. Wow. I think you've done a really good job. Thank you. I wouldn't even mind if you put a little bit back more of your character. When we visited the Hotel Millers, mm -hmm. we decided that we would take the rooms back and have this as a beginning. Yeah. Ah, 
this is the room we could barely get into for old television sets, was it? It's just marvellous. I love the chaise long and all this mahogany furniture. It works, doesn't it? <laughs> well, what do you think? What a lovely place to have breakfast. And it hasn't got any crowd in it. It's just got tables and things that are pertinent. And the chairs that you don't like. <laughs> and the chairs I don't like. And I really have said, you're not ever going to persuade me these are appropriate for your house. Yeah. You've got a breakfast menu with full English and Suffolk ingredients, but I like the fact that you say naturally our beans are from that famous producer of beans. When it comes to breakfast service, Steve has a revelation for Ruth. I have to tell you, I did do a course. I went down to a friend of mine in the village and asked him if I could go and wait at his cafeteria for nothing. And uh, I did, and it was good fun. I'm really impressed by that, actually, because I know you were a bit miffed about the whole notion that I was, I was questioning your devotion to this job. Um, and I think, you know, full marks for realising that it wasn't your strength and for going out and doing something about it. But what I did learn at Jerry's is that people who are being waited on are up for fun. Yeah. They're up to have a joke. Obviously not everybody and you have to no. be a little smart about I can assure you if my husband was sitting here at the breakfast table with his face buried in his paper and you came and tried to have jokes with him, you'd get short shrift. It's June and after years as a family home, Creeting House is welcoming its very first paying guests. Hello, are you Roger? Let me give it, take that yes, for thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve. Hi, ah, ah, Roger. Nice to meet you, Roger. Diana and Steve are in at the deep end with two couples arriving for the same night. If, if there's anything you want, just ask you if we yeah. can help, we will. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just, I won't say make your house your home, because I haven't seen your home yet. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the guests are expecting a professional service, so first impressions are crucial. I thought uh, Steve and Diane were, were very uh, helpful, friendly. Very laid back and very relaxed. Have you come far? Leeds. Oh, wow. Leeds. It's actually one of my favourite stories, my Alan Bennett story. Oh, right. It's from an old sketch where he was in a pub and he was sat with a friend. He goes, You're married, aren't you? He says, Yeah. He said, yeah. He said Sexual intercourse. He said, How long does it take? He said, Anything up to two hours. He goes, Christ, man, you could be in Leeds. <laughs> oh, I, dear, oh, dear. That's oh. a long old way. Steve seems to be relishing his role as host. It's strange. I can't not think of them as like friends, and I want to go up and make sure they've got everything they need, and yeah. you know. Well, we're so used to having people stay here. Um, yeah. it's, you, you have to leave them alone. Yeah. They only want these people alone. only want bed and breakfast. Yeah. The following morning, Steve is up early, eager to try his newly earned waiting skills at the breakfast table. Right, that's the menu. Thank you very much. I'll have the, um, the full English yep. with baked beans. And I'll have full English without any eggs at all, thank you. I have every confidence in Steve's waiting ability. The only problem is he chats to people such a lot that uh, it could take a while. Can I have some black pudding with mine? Of course you can. I'm well set up, he said, wondering where the hell the other pencil went. What does that do with it? I'll take your pen off you, actually, because I can't find the darn thing now. I've got to get me carbon in the right place and God knows what. It's very technical, this. Right, try it. What does that say? One full breakfast plus beans and an extra egg. One full breakfast, no egg. Is that all right? That's absolutely fine. Fantastic. Appearing to enjoy himself, Steve is stepping up to the plate. Even when there's a minor hiccup with one of the orders. Die. Yeah. The eggs on the door. But with a bit of smooth talking, he manages to avert disaster. Right, well, just, there's just a little bit of divergence in time. I'll be back with yours in two seconds. Ah, oh, sorry, I lied. It'll be a bit longer than that. Muddling through, the last really sorry plate is set. <laughs> Just rather it was right than ha 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 ha. Okay, lovely. Diana and Steve have made it through their first breakfast service. 
Steve was uh, very unique in his waitering style, let's say. He was very friendly. Slightly quirky and a nice personal touch. I enjoyed it. A uh, humorous side to it, but uh, very nice. Diana and Steve have won their guests over, but they don't know there's a much bigger trial ahead. Ruth has booked a visit from an undercover inspector who will decide whether Creeting House deserves the four stars Diana desires. There is dust on the bedside cabinets to both sides of the four poster bed, so there's quite a lot of dust behind them. It's seven weeks since the remodelled, tidy Creeting House opened as a B&B. And since then, Diana and Steve have been busy entertaining guests. But unbeknownst to them, one big test remains. To see if their endeavours could win them a star rating, Ruth is sending in her secret inspector. Working for the official tourist board, Visit England, her assessment will make or break Diana's dreams of an ambitious four stars. I am, yes. Yeah. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Steve has no idea he's greeting an official inspector wearing a hidden camera. Uh, this is Creature House, welcome. Thank you. Because her work is undercover, yeah, her identity must be protected. You're here in what we call the four poster room. Lovely. Luckily, she's been allocated their best room. Yeah, thanks for your help. Bye. Alone in her room, the inspector can start to evaluate the bedroom's standard and cleanliness. Looking at decor, practical painted walls, um, neutral decor, mattresses is of a good quality. There's plenty of space to walk around this room. So this bedroom offers um, good to very good ease of use. So far, so good. But next, the inspector starts to search the room more closely. A little bit of dust on the top of that mirror. Quite a lot of dust on the top of the wardrobe. Bedside lights, dust on the top of there. Again, lots of dust noticeable on the top of the skirting boards. And let's just pull out this bedside unit and have a look at the dust down here. Again, yeah, quite a lot of dust behind the units, so furniture needs to be pulled out regularly. The inspector has breakfast. Thanks a lot, that's good. Thanks. I'll leave you to it now because uh, I tend to hang around and talk so much anyway. She's scrutinising the service, food, and hospitality. It's nearly the end of the inspector's stay in the new look Creeting House. But when she checks out, Diana leads her into a back room piled high with belongings which never made it to the tip. So it's up my study at home. <laughs> At the end of the inspector's stay, Ruth is back to unveil the truth to Diana and Steve. Last night, your guest was an official inspector from Visit England. I knew she was, because I've got the bath mat. But anyway, <laughs> she was very nice. It was fun. <laughs> Hello. May I introduce? Well, Hello, nice to meet you again. <laughs> now, you stayed last night. How did you find things? I got a very exuberant welcome. It was very good. Yeah, no, very lovely. Good. Mm. And how did you find the room? Yeah, very bright, airy, um, good, you know, very good room. Was everything clean? Um, no, that, that's one area that I, I think you could definitely improve on. I pulled out bedside cabinets, for instance, and there's quite a lot of dust behind them. There was dust on the um, bedside cabinets to both sides of the four poster bed. So a little bit more of attention to detail, I would say. What about breakfast? How did that go? Breakfast, um, very good choice on the um, menu. Steve was very chatty, made me feel very welcome, so uh, very good. So Steve, you are suited to this. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> the inspector isn't finished yet. As part of Visit England's assessment, she must look round all the other rooms. So in here, we've got central lights and task lights, very task good. Lights. Neutral decor, very easy to maintain. Advising Diana and Steve on areas for improvement. Light exclusion on your curtains could be better. I couldn't find the hairdryer in the full poster as well. Before leaving, she reveals to Ruth whether Creeting House will be awarded those ambitious four stars. The inspector has done her tour and she has given me your rating. I think what you've done which is remarkable and commendable is that you have 
worked against in a way part of your nature which is let me be frank slobby <laughs> okay you've still concealed stuff in other rooms the inspector didn't like when she came to pay her bill you actually dragged her into the office and of course she then saw the back of what goes on here yeah. and what was prevalent throughout the whole house when yeah. i first arrived everything that she scored you on in terms of the guest experience you did really well you were marked down in points because of the, the dust and bits and pieces. Now that Ruth has passed on her advice, she's ready to reveal the inspector's rating. It's four stars. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thank you. What's really held it up is you've done a great job on the rooms and the facilities, and most importantly, you are hospitable people. I think you're going to make great hoteliers. I think you made fantastic progress. You know, the rooms are really good, and I really wish you every success, and I think you will be successful. The thing is, our kids can't afford to stay here. <laughs> have you told them what the room rates are? Yes, we have. We've written a letter to each of them. <laughs> Well, just get confirmation of the booking before they turn up, because if they cancel without due notice, of course, then it's a penalty. Should we take a deposit? I think you should. Yeah, we will then. <laughs> I was so surprised when Ruth said to me, you've got four-star rating, and so relieved, because this has been a real slog. This has been a real hard learning curve. To turn your own house into guest accommodation doesn't just require physical effort. You've also got to have a change of mindset. And I have to say that Steve and Diana have pulled off this transformation with great aplomb. 